I remember whenever I was 13 and there was a new kid who just sat down right at my lunch table. He just looks me dead in the eyes and he says, I hate to say this, but you're going to hell. Hey, everybody. We're excited to be here with you today. I'm Brett. I'm Wilson. And we want to introduce ourselves to you, but we also want to introduce ourselves to each other because me and Wilson met today. Yeah. It's been a pleasure so far, so hopefully it uh, doesn't go south. Kind of depends what questions are in here. <laughs> See what they have cooked up for us. So yeah, so we're actually going to be drawing a few questions from this bowl, and we're just going to answer them and see what happens. Go from there. Who did you vote for in the 2016 presidential election and why? So no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, a, <laughs> that's a great question. Let's see. In 2016, I was 14 years old. So <laughs> not Perfect. quite able to, to vote yet. Okay, this question's actually pretty fire. I love the word usage here. Shout out to Rachel. Do you live by any particular mantra? Oh, a particular mantra. Um, I guess like this kind of goes back to like my, my sports days. I played a lot of baseball growing up, but it's just like get the next one. Because like a lot of the times like I'd mess up on something and I just kind of be like, I don't know I get in my head, get really down, but my dad would always just kind of be like, "Hey, keep your head up, just get the next one. Like, forget whatever happened in the past. Like, don't worry about it. That's just so get the good. next one. That was a way good. I don't know. Thank you. I love that. I mean, I can't take credit for it. It was on my dad. Yeah. So but you adopted the right one. <laughs> Thank you. Here's the ball, Wilson. Thank you. Let's see. Okay, what is something that makes you feel unstoppable? Um, after I stopped using drugs, I had to find <laughs> something. Just kidding. I'm sorry I said that like that. It is just such a habit. Okay, something that makes me feel like, wow, unstoppable. We deep right there. <laughs> this is going to sound so funny, but no, it's not going to sound funny. Everyone's going to relate. When I don't use my phone for social media, when I have like an abstinence of social media and like YouTube usage, I feel like I could do anything. It's like I am in control of my life. Like I'm yes. in my lane. Like yeah. <laughs> my my self control is like maxed out. My productivity, my attention span, like yeah, everything. Exactly. <laughs> it's exactly like that. All right. Hit me with the next one. I don't want to offend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I put that one back. <laughs> oh. What are three words you would describe yourself with? Oh my gosh. Three words. <sighs> Testing my vocabulary here. Yeah, that's um <laughs> you want to sound refined. I guess I'd go with like, okay, if I hyphenate two words, is that, okay. does that count as let's, one? Let's see how this goes. No, okay. Can I go with like lighthearted? Yeah. Lighthearted. Lighthearted. Um, kind. I try to be. I think you're kind, Well, Happy. Brett, thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate that. Lighthearted, I kind, try. and happy. Try to be that guy. Okay, Brett, if money were no object, what's the first thing you would buy? If money were no object, what's the first thing I would buy? Okay, two part. Number one, oh. Tesla Model S. <laughs> it's so much fun. And part B, I love botanical gardens. So if I was an eccentric billionaire, I would buy like 20 acres of land, either here or someplace where it rains more, and just like work with top of the line landscapers to create gardens, flower beds, giant trees, vines crawling up walls. That's for sure my billionaire fantasy. Wow. Okay. Specific, yes. I mean, like Tesla, yes. Like I, I can see that. Botanical garden might not be in my top twenty things. Okay. But I respect it. Like chase your dreams. In fact, anywhere me and I go on vacation with me and my family, I always make it a point to visit the local botanical garden. <laughs> All right, Wilson. I have a little bit weightier of a question, a little bit more serious. All right. All right. I want to hear about your conversion to Jesus Christ. How did it happen? What were some major milestones in that journey? So I guess, I guess I'll start with, by saying like I was born into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, but I wouldn't necessarily say that that constitutes my conversion to Christ. Totally agree. Like it's, I mean, like my conversion story is pretty boring. Like I turned eight and I got baptized, right? But like when it comes to conversion to Christ, I guess growing up, I grew up in Texas, and it's a pretty um, I don't know it's a part of the Bible Belt, so everyone yes. there loves Jesus, but no one can quite agree on how or why, and so everyone loves <laughs> to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I kind of remember like growing up in the church, thought it was a great thing, um, loved it, 
kind of did a lot for my parents because I thought it was the right thing to do, you know. But everything started kind of really getting real for me around middle school. I remember whenever I was 13 and there was a new kid who just sat down right at my lunch table and he saw that I had a little BYU sticker on my water bottle. And then he was like, oh, I mean, this was, this was like, you know, a while ago. So he's like, oh, are you a Mormon? And I was like, yeah. I was just like surprised that somebody knew what the church was. That's how we find each other, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> BYU <It's true>. memorabilia. A hundred percent, hundred percent. But so I thought like, oh, like, you know, I never met him before. Maybe he's also a member or something. Maybe he's been to Utah. But he just looks me dead in the eyes and he says, I hate to say this, but you're going to hell. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, I'm going right. to let you down softly, That's but a... <laughs> you're burning for eternity. <laughs> yeah. Just like that. So I kind of like, it was from that point on, whenever I started having to engage with a lot of my fellow peers, my friends about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and kind of what it meant to be a member there. And so I spent a lot of time in my teenage years digging into the gospel of Jesus Christ and even into aspects of church history, church doctrine. And that's kind of where I really felt like I started to build my testimony and convert to Christ. And I feel like a lot of this kind of crescendoed um, pretty much whenever I graduated and I started going to college. And I remember my freshman year, I like my very first Sunday, when it's whenever, you know, we go to church. Very first Sunday, I just, I woke up, we had church at 8.30, super, I mean, like for a college kid, college freshman, super early. I've been up late the night yeah. before. Uh -huh. <laughs> 8.30 is like the new 6 a.m., like I swear. <laughs> There's like an offset, yeah, like a shift. <laughs> yes. But I remember I woke up early just to get ready to go to church. And I just sat on my bed and I just thought, nobody would care if I didn't go to church right now. Nobody would know. No parents, no siblings, nobody here knows me. I could go right back to bed and nobody would care. And so I thought about that for a little bit. And then I just felt something inside of me that wanted to go to church. Something that was there, I felt like I needed. So I made the decision to just get up and go. And I feel like whenever I started becoming conscious of there's something about the gospel of Jesus Christ that I need in my life, I started going on this journey to find out what it was. And the more I thought about it, I kind of came across the fact that it was the sacrament and this relationship that I was forming with Jesus Christ. And that kind of brought me to another moment that I had on my mission. And this was just kind of like, this is during the time of COVID. And so I was in home MTC, which is just like a lot of Zoom classes and a lot of trying to learn a foreign language over Zoom. So pretty tricky. But I remember I was called to serve in the Sweden Stockholm mission, but because of visa processing time and because of, you know, the pandemic, the global pandemic that was going on, I received the news that I wouldn't be going directly to Sweden, that I was going to be reassigned. That's hard. And it, it, that, kind of, that news kind of hit me like a truck. And I was really frustrated with God because I felt like, you know, I'd really been developing this relationship with yeah. Heavenly Father. And it felt like, you know, Sweden was where he wanted me to be. It's where I was called to be. And I just didn't get why I wasn't, get to go, wasn't, why I wasn't going to get to go there. Like, why couldn't he provide some sort of miracle to allow me just to help people? So I was just really confused. And I just remember one night, I just kind of been angry about it all day. He's been in the dumps, been just kind of a jerk. <laughs> and I remembered just what I'd been taught since I was a little kid about whenever you're going through a hard time, just to say a prayer. And it seems so simple, right? But in the moment, it, you, you, showing that kind of humility is never something you want to do. Yes. But I, that night I got on, I was in my room, just sitting on my bed and I got on my knees and I said a prayer. And it was one of those angry prayers. I was just talking to Heavenly Father, just expressing all these feelings I had about why can't I just go do what you want me to do? What I feel like you wanted me to do. And 
I finished this prayer and then I didn't really feel like relieved or anything. I just sat on my bed and was still just kind of angry. And what happened was, it just, it's a moment I'll never forget. But I was just sitting on my bed and I always have thoughts just like running through my brain. Like there's always something going on. Like I never really have stillness. But for just a moment, my entire head was was clear and quiet and still. And I heard a voice that I know wasn't my own. I was I was home alone. But all it said to me was, be patient, my son. I have a work for thee to do. And that would like the Holy Ghost has never really spoken to me before, like really kind of audibly like I heard it. It's probably the only time. But that moment was all that I needed because I knew that God knew where I was. He wasn't just going to forget about me. He had a plan and that we had this covenant relationship and that wasn't going to change. That's beautiful, Wilson. I find it super relatable that you wanted something righteous, that your desires were to go serve the people in Sweden. And you just like had that question of why isn't God helping me accomplish this? I think that's pretty relatable. Um, and thank you for sharing that experience. Of course. I, mean, I guess God didn't remove that immediately after that prayer. No. But the, uh, the Holy Ghost can really calm. It can really bring peace to you on matters that have been upsetting you. Now, is it time that we kind of turn the tables here? And maybe, Brett, you share a little bit about your conversion story? I would love if you passed me the baton. <laughs> <laughs> Metaphorical <you>. passing. Received. <laughs> Received and ready. I resonated with the beginning of your story. A lot of times we talk about conversion as the moment of baptism. That's like a common theme in Christianity. I, like you, was born in the church, in the covenant. I was baptized at eight years of age. And my parents were both very active. They attended the temple. They served diligently in their callings. Mm -hmm. And I watched that growing up. <clears throat> and I can remember times throughout my teenage years, feeling the spirit strongly, what I would later come to recognize as the spirit, musical numbers, talks, yeah, testimonies yeah. that people had shared. And I didn't really recognize at the time, but like you were saying, I f it was a unique experience. It was, it was a peace. It was a stillness that I, mm -hmm. I hadn't found anywhere else. And those experiences gave me some curiosity as I grew into high school and wanted to know more about the church and find things out. And I would read the Book of Mormon. I would read the scriptures and pray about it. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I received witnesses of the truthfulness of this work. And in a way, I kind of just left it there. That was it. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, this is this is true. But I never really asked myself what that meant. I don't know if it had as big of an impact on me, my behavior as it should have. Mm -hmm. So I prepared for a mission and got my call and started. And I had some experience on my mission that kind of put me all in on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Of course. They're like, this is it. <laughs> like, this is the way to be happy. This is the yeah. truth, the life, and the way to the Savior. The first was... In the MTC, we would read the scriptures every day for an hour. <laughs> and at the end of six oh. weeks, yeah, it's like... No, it's, it changes you. It changes you. It has an impact. Yeah, and that realization of that change, it hit me like, I don't know, like a train. At the end of that six months, or that six weeks, oh, six months, no. Oh, six months in the MTC. <laughs> at the end oh of gosh. six weeks, I noticed that I was just so much more optimistic and happy, mm -hmm. just so much less cynical. And I'm like, where is this coming from? And it was the scriptures. The power of God's word brings you closer to Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And I had always learned that and believed that was true, but it was the first time I lived it. And you experienced it. Yeah. You saw it in yourself. And it had a profound impact. Later in my mission, there were two kind of phases and events that I remember super clearly. One of them was like a year and a half through my mission, we started giving like people blessings. Yeah. Like we would okay. ask them like, hey, you know, investigators like, We'd teach them about the priesthood, be like, would you like a blessing of, of guidance or counsel or comfort? And so we'd lay our hands on their head and seek inspiration from the Lord to bless this person. And with people I didn't know, had, weren't experienced with, not a huge part of relationship, 
I was filled with God's love as we put our hands on them and spoke words. I was overwhelmed to realize like how God felt about all of his children. Wow. Um, and that was really special for me to find that out, just to realize how much Jesus Christ loves us. Mm-hmm. And that changes you when you feel his love. Oh, just like a glimpse of that, like seeing it for yourself, for other people, like it's so special. Yeah. The final experience, I remember walking through a field at the end of my mission and experiencing that same happiness, that joy of the Spirit. And I asked myself the question super ungratefully, like, why didn't my parents tell me about this? Like, they told me to like, keep the commandments and things, but why didn't they tell me that this is the way to be happy? That, like, <laughs> the issues I face, I've got the solutions. <laughs> They had this big secret the whole time. Like, yeah, what the I heck? Felt that way. <laughs> and in that moment, as I thought that, I felt such a strong rebuke from the spirit being like, your parents, for one, A, did tell you <laughs> and B, what they didn't tell you, they showed you. And images f- flashed through my mind of all the times my parents had made time to go to the temple, the mm-hmm. times that my father had brought me along for then home teaching, for the times that they shared their testimonies with me, they had gone to help neighbors. Just they're living the gospel of Jesus Christ and being examples of him just washed over me. And I realized maybe they didn't explicitly say every word and everything that I had learned, but they showed me how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I realized that's what I want my life to look like. Yeah. Like I want that joy that my parents had and that they shared with me. Um, yeah. That is awesome. Right. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. And it reminded me a lot of like, I don't know, like small and simple means, right? Because that's how a lot of the gospel works. Like, you know, the Lord says he will reveal line upon line, precept upon precept, here little and there little. And that's kind of a lot of what your experiences sounded like, where it's not always these huge moments that come in and that change us. Like, it's not like Alma seeing the angel or Paul on the road to Damascus. But for a lot of us, it's these small and simple experiences that we have that make these huge impacts in our lives. So I love that. Thanks, Wilson. Of course, of course. Well, guys, thank you. We've enjoyed meeting each other principally <laughs> and introducing ourselves to you guys as well. We appreciate it. Once you're done watching the video, go ahead and leave a like or a comment and tell us a little bit about your conversion story and what has brought you closer to Christ. Thanks for watching, everybody.